Okay, in the last video, we discussed the different ways to find enthalpy. And again, to recap, we can use stoichiometry, we can use coffee cup calorimetry, we can do the flippy thing, we can use heat of formation values and use big mama. We can also use bond energies to find enthalpy. So I think we've got enthalpy under our belts, and now we're going to move on to the second thermodynamic term known as entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder, and nature tends toward disorder. If you don't believe me, go clean your room and then see how long it stays clean. We tend to disorder. So that is considered a positive value. The more disorder we have, the more positive our numerical value of entropy is. And I want you to always look at it in terms of disorder. Don't say ordered, do disorder. So the more disorder we have, our entropy value is positive. The less disorder we have, our entropy value is negative. And we can calculate delta S in the same ways, in some of the same ways that we could find enthalpy. We can use a table of standard entropy values and apply big mama, which is also known as Hess's law, which I didn't mention at all in any of the enthalpy videos. Bad teacher. Anyway, Hess's law is just basically saying that these things are state functions and we can, in multiple fashions, determine what the delta H, and in this case, delta S is. So another thing I need you to know, <clears throat> cough, cough, is what the second law of thermodynamics states. So we know the first one has to do with conservation of energy, and the second law of thermodynamics has to do with the universe increasing in disorder. Second law of thermodynamics is, is pretty important and it states that the entropy of the universe will increase for any spontaneous process. So we're going to focus in a bit on the ways to determine when something is spontaneous, also known as thermodynamically favored. And one of the ways to determine spontaneity is knowing that the entropy, not of the system, not of the surroundings, not of the reaction, but the entropy of the universe is positive. So again, we can calculate um, delta S using big mama and a bunch of values, just like we did delta H. And when I say we're using the big mama equation, that's to find the enthalpy of the reaction, not of the universe. To find the enthalpy of the universe is a pretty complex problem. And so we're going to do a couple like that. I don't want you to stress about how to find it. You will have to. It's not, it's, it's not that difficult, but it's not as simple as saying, oh, entropy of the reaction is positive. No, no, no. For it to be thermodynamically favored, the entropy of the universe has to be positive. So if we go down this little list of equations here, the entropy of the universe is equal to the entropy of the system and the surroundings, which makes sense because that's what all there is. There's a system and its surroundings. So we know how to find the entropy of the system. That's just using big mama. Well, how do we find the entropy of the surroundings? Well, this is not an issue of heat. We can't just change the sign. What we have to do is find the delta H of the surroundings divided by T. Delta H of the surroundings divided by T is equal to the entropy of the surroundings. Well, still, how do we find delta H of the surroundings? We didn't learn that. We learned how to find delta H of the system. Well, if heat leaves the surroundings, it enters the system. So we can say that the entropy of the surroundings is just the negative entropy of the system. So to find the entropy of the universe, you would find the entropy of the system minus the enthalpy of the system divided by T. So we're going to practice that here momentarily. And again, a reminder for like the 800th time, we can use Big Mama to find the delta S of the system. But to determine if it's spontaneous or thermodynamically favored, we have to find the delta S of the universe. I need you to know that those are two different things. 
All right, for this reaction, we are going to find the delta S of the following. And if you notice, we have a table, and this table is giving us all three thermodynamic terms of delta H, delta S, and delta G. That's how usually this information is organized. Um, there's a little mistake in the table where delta S is. The actual value, the unit values for the delta S is joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, and I want you to notice that this is in joules, and your delta G and your delta H's are in kilojoules, and that's going to be an issue we have to talk about at some point. But right now, we're just going to find the delta S. Given these values, these standard values, and if you see the little knot there, that means standard conditions of 298K and 1 ATM, we're going to use Big Mama and solve. So the delta S of the reaction is equal to, we're going to do products minus reactants. So our one product of aluminum chloride has a delta H of 111 joules per mole Kelvin. And then we're going to minus reactants, products minus reactants. So our aluminum, 1 times 28, notice that free elements do not have a zero entropy. They only have a zero enthalpy and free energy. And then to that, we're going to add 3 halves using that coefficient in the balanced equation of 223. So that's products minus reactants. So we're going to solve for that. And when I solve for that, I get negative 251 joules per mole Kelvin. And again, it's mole of reaction. And that's our delta S using Big Mama. All right. Um, in this problem, we have to, it says, consider the following reaction. We have a data table, and as I'm scanning through this, I see the whole, oh, entropy of the universe. We're going to have some calculations to do. So I know I'm going to need to pay attention to temperature because that's part of that, con that, that calculation. So I'm just going to look up here, and I don't really see a temperature, but I do see these standards and when I don't have a specific temperature to work with, I'm going to assume standard conditions of 25 degrees Celsius or 298K. That's an important thing to note. So part A says calculate the change of entropy of the system. Remember, when we find entropy of a system, that's when we're allowed to use Big Mama. So Big Mama, entropy of the system, delta S is equal to products minus reactants, 2 of ammonia times 193, and I'm just going to leave the units out for space sake, minus reactants of 1 times the nitrogen of 192, plus 3 times the hydrogen of 131. So when I do my math here, I end up with an entropy of negative 199 joules per mole Kelvin. Now we're going to talk about this momentarily because we can kind of predict what's going to happen to entropy by looking at um, what's going on in the equation. So if you notice in this equation, we have... Four moles of gas becoming two moles of gas, well, that's becoming less disordered. There's less chaos there. So that should be predicted as a negative delta S, which does follow what we calculated with that negative 199. Okay, part B then says calculate the change in entropy of the surroundings. So I don't know if you remember from that first page that our delta S of the surroundings is actually equal to the delta H of the surroundings divided by T. But we don't know how to calculate the delta H of the surroundings. We only know how to calculate the delta H of the system. So we're going to take the negative delta H of the system, which is opposite of the surroundings, divided by the Kelvin temperature. So let's do that. This one's easy because it's a bunch of free elements, so there's not a lot of math. The delta H of the system is equal to 2 which is our number of ammonia moles times negative 46.1 from the table. And that gives us negative 92.2 kilojoules per mole. Awesome, except 
that is the delta H of the system, right? So to do the delta H of the surroundings, which is what we want, we're going to take that sign and change it. Now, another thing I'm going to do at the same time, because notice this was in joules, we can't add system and surroundings unless we're in the same unit. So I'm going to make my delta H of the surroundings equal to 92,200. And notice I made it positive. And then I'm going to divide that delta H of the surroundings divided by T. That's going to give me the delta S of the surroundings. So 9, 92,200 joules divided by my temperature of 298, that's why I mentioned that at the beginning, gives me the delta S of the surroundings of 309.4. All right, that's awesome. So I've got that in joules. So now it says calculate the change of entropy of the universe. Well, we're going to add the two. The entropy of the universe is equal to the system of negative 199. And again, we're in joules, so we're cool. Plus the surroundings of 309.4, giving me a final delta H, uh, delta S of the universe of 110 point, I'm just going to keep three sig figs, joules per mole K. All right, last question then. The most important part of all of this is your understanding of that number as opposed to finding that number is, is the reaction thermodynamically favored, meaning is it going to happen spontaneously? And the answer to that is, why yes, why? Because the delta S of the universe is positive. So when the delta S of the universe, not the system, not the surroundings, the universe is positive, we have a thermodynamically favored or spontaneous reaction. One of the more popular ways of determining entropy, well at least the sign of entropy, is looking at the states. Um, when you go from, for instance, from liquids to gases or from solids to all gases, those are increases of entropy, entropy, which means our delta S's are positive. So a lot of times we can just look at what's going on in the system and decide from that. So if you look here at number 24, it says predict whether the entropy of the system increases, remain constant, or decreases. So when ice melts, well, that's definitely more disorder. So that's an increase. In entropy. A precipitate forms, while well, we're going from crazy liquid ions to solid, which is less disordered, so disorder decreases. When something dissolves from solid to liquid, we have an increase in disorder. And when gas condenses, we're going from mad gas chaos to more ordered liquids, so order disorder decreases. Those are pretty easy. Um, another thing that we need to be able to do is look at a reaction and the states of matter involved. And here we're going to predict the actual sign of entropy. So we're going from two moles of gas to a mole of solid. That is definitely a decrease, which means delta S is negative. Here we're going from gas to gas, but it's the number of moles that indicate the disorder in that case. So it's like if I have five students running around the classroom and then I have 25 students running around the classroom, there's going to be a lot more disorder when we have more gas molecules so or gas moles. So here this is an increase in disorder. Here I'm going from nine moles of gas to four moles of gas and some liquid. So I'm going from all gas to some gas and some liquid, that is a decrease in disorder. This has shown up on occasion and kind of threw students for a loop. Um, notice that we're solid copper in both situations. However, when we increase temperature, and even though a phase change doesn't happen, those molecules are vibrating more intensely and, and starting to move around a little bit more. So there is more disorder at higher temperatures. So just because you don't have a phase change doesn't mean there isn't a change in disorder. So here, 
low to high temperature, we do have an increase in disorder because the molecules are moving more rapidly. So now we're moving on to free energy. Free energy is actually just the energy that's available after a chemical reaction or while a chemical reaction happens to available to do work. So again, lots of different ways you can solve. If you want to use Big Mama, there are some there are some restrictions. You can only use Big Mama for delta G if we're at standard conditions. Delta G is super temperature dependent, and if you want to use that Big Mama, it has to be at 25. So what do we do if we're not at 25? How do we find delta G? This is the ghetto homies equation. If you want to know what that stands for, come and talk to your chem teacher. Um, they'll tell you. And we can use our delta G and find our delta H and our delta S from the tables because they're not quite as temperature dependent. So we're going to use Big Mama for both of these. Put in our non-298 temperature and solve for the delta G. There is something you need to watch for when you are um, solving for your delta G using the ghetto homies equation. You've got to watch your units because when you have a table, your delta H will be given to you in kilojoules while your delta S will be in joules. So you're always going to have to make some sort of conversion, convert one or the other of those so they are the same before you put them into that equation. So what knowing delta G leads to is probably the most important reason we calculate delta G because delta G can also tell us if a system is spontaneous or thermodynamically favored. Um, it's a more common way of finding whether a system is thermodynamically favored than finding the entropy of the universe. I don't know if you remember entropy of the universe. That was kind of a pain to calculate when we just did that. So this is your more common way. So if we find the delta H of the system, I'm sorry, G, if we find the delta G of the system and we get a negative value, a negative delta G refer, this makes you realize that the reaction is spontaneous. So the only two ways, and I'm going to repeat this and you're going to be like, shut up, Demo. We're going to listen to you at one and a half speed because you talk too much. Well, you need to listen when I'm telling you the only two ways to find thermodynamic flavorability is entropy of the universe, not the system and the surroundings, the universe, or delta G of the system. So delta G of the system, its main reason is to determine whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. That's kind of the whole reason we do it. So we're going to um, find delta G for this reaction two different ways. I need to make sure this equation is balanced. And um, because they don't really give us a temperature and there's a little not there, standard conditions, we can assume that this is 298K. So technically we're allowed to use either Big Mama or Ghetto Homies, but I'm going to show you both so you see that they are the same. Um, remember, Big Mama, which I'm going to show you first, can only be used for free energy if we're at 25 degrees Celsius or 298K. So delta G is equal to products minus reactants, 1 times negative 629. And luckily, 0 is the value of our free elements for delta G. So our final delta G of the reaction at standard conditions is negative 6. 29 kilojoules per mole. So that's what we get for that. And now I'm going to go ahead and find delta G using ghetto homies. Delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So I need delta H and I need delta S. Um, to find delta H, we're going to use big mama, products minus reactants. So Again, because our free elements are, have a delta H of zero, it makes our math pretty easy. Products minus reactants. So our delta H for this reaction is negative 704 kilojoules per mole. We also need to have somehow delta S. And if you look back at number 22 in these notes, we found that um, delta S was... 
from neck from number 22 was negative 251 joules per mole. Now the bad news is we can't put kilojoules and joules into ghetto homey, so I'm just going to convert this one to kilojoules. I personally do not care which way you go. Um, tomorrow, or in, sorry, in the next lecture, we're going to be calculating K and some other things that will require you to have it in joules, but unless you're in a scenario like that, you can use whichever you want. So my final plugging in into Ghetto Homies, I'm just going to take my delta H I just calculated at negative 704 minus 298 times negative 0.251. So my delta G, when I put it in my calculator, oh, looky there. Imagine that it matches. So yeah, my choice for kilojoules here was mainly because we were comparing it to something in kilojoules. And again, I wanted to prove that you could use either method. And Big Mama, don't forget, is restricted to 25 degrees or 298K when using Big Mama for free energy. Okay, so now I want to talk about using the Ghetto Homies equation to determine if something is going to be spontaneous or thermodynamically favored. You're going to hear me say thermodynamically favored a lot because um, that is what they now are going to use on the AP you are still allowed to say something spontaneous, but you will never be asked a question about something be, being spontaneous. You will only be asked if something is thermodynamically favored. I don't know if that even showed up. No, it didn't. Thermodynamically favored. So those kind of are interchangeable for the most part. But um, why that's important is because of the need to look at two things to determine thermodynamic favorability. You have to not only look at your sign of G, which would be negative if we're thermodynamically favored. You also can look at values of delta H and delta S to determine thermodynamic favorability. And what combinations of temperatures create thermodynamic favorability. So let's just start with our, our first possible combinations. Um, if we, for instance, have an exothermic reaction that has an increase in entropy, well, what temperatures would thermodynamic favorability be possible. Well, first off, you got to start and remember that we want a delta G to be negative under those conditions. In order for thermodynamic favorability to happen, we need a negative delta G. So, if I have an exothermic reaction, it means that is negative. If I have an increase in entropy, it means this is positive. So, at what temperatures will we be overall negative. Will we get this? Well, if you look at the two terms, we have a negative minus something. Well, since we're on the Kelvin scale, temperature is always going to be positive. So if we have a negative and all we can do is minus things from it, that's always going to be negative. So this, in the case of exothermicity with an increase in disorder, that's going to be spontaneous at all temps. So a lot of times you'll be given questions and they'll give you um, these, any, any one of these four combinations and you have to say, you know, at what temperature range we're going to have a thermodynamic favorability or a spontaneous reaction. So that takes care of that combination. Let's do the combination of endothermic with an increase in entropy. At what temperatures will that be spontaneous? Well... Again, I want negative if I'm going to be spontaneous. If I'm endothermic, that is positive. And increase in entropy, that is positive. Well, 
Okay, looking at this then, if I want delta G to be negative, this negative term needs to take over the positive delta H, right? So to do that, that has to be a high temperature then to make that happen. So this is only spontaneous at high temps. Please don't memorize this. I want you to be able just to apply the math like I'm doing because it's a waste of brain space to have to sit there and try to memorize it. So let's look at our third possible combination. Let's say we have an exothermic reaction with a decrease in entropy. Well, here, again, we want, we're looking for when is delta G negative. Okay, well, exothermic means that's negative. Decrease in entropy means this is negative as well. So just looking at algebra rules, if I have a negative minus a negative, I'm really positive, positive, right? So if I want delta H, sorry, delta G to be negative, that delta H term needs to take over because it's the negative term. Well, I don't want that T delta S positivity to overcome, so this will only be spontaneous at low temperatures. And then my last possible combination, which is blah, endothermic decrease in entropy. Well, I want a negative here. I want endothermic, so that means this is positive, and de decrease in entropy means that's negative. And again, algebra rules, uh-oh. Do you see how that's always positive? So this is never, at no temperatures will that be thermodynamically favored. Um, so I've seen, I've graded actual student AP problems where students have just used enthalpy to determine whether something is spontaneous, saying things like, oh, exothermic reactions are all spontaneous. No, they're not. You see that here, especially when we have a decrease in entropy. We have a series of restrictions in that case. So how I would handle this with IRU, I would know the always and the never. I would know that if you're exothermic and increased in entropy, and we know the universe likes a an increase in disorder, exothermic, increase in disorder, always spontaneous. An endothermic decrease is never. And then the other ones you can kind of figure out. But you've got to understand that you cannot determine this sign or you cannot determine thermodynamic favorability just by delta H or delta S alone. You have to look at both of those things independently. So what we're going to do here is um, calculate the temperature at which the reaction becomes thermodynamically favored. Well, this is cool because we're going to use ghetto homies, and we know we want the point where something just starts to become negative. So we're going to basically set delta G equal to zero. At that point, it's either going to become negative or positive. So that's the point where spontaneity will occur. So we're going to use ghetto homies. We know delta G is going to be zero. That's kind of where our midpoint of that is, the cusp between spontaneity. So what about the H and S? Oh, my goodness, what do we do? Yeah, you're right. We're going to have to do big mama first. And once we find big mama, we can plug all of that into ghetto homies and solve for the temperature at which that happens. So I'm going to write really small <laughs> to the best I can, um, or I might actually just enlarge it here to give, give myself a little more space. And we're going to go ahead and solve for delta H first, delta H. So that's equal to, I've got 313. I'm using the table values below, minus negative 92.3 plus negative 46.1, and that's going to be equal to negative 174.6 kilojoules per mole. All right, my delta S then, and you guys can stop the video while um, in between my calcs and check them yourself. I think it's important because I could be wrong. You know, I, I make mistakes too, believe it or not. I know you guys think I'm absolutely perfect. <laughs> Funny. Um, so I do 95 products minus reactants there, and I get a negative 285, but remember this is joules per mole, 
K, and I need to be in kilojoules, or I need to turn that to the other one to joules, whichever. But since I'm already starting this, I'm going to convert this to kilojoules. So 0, negative 0 0.2. I have 8.5, then I have 8.8, 8, so I don't know which it is. It might be 8.5, so you can adjust accordingly. Kilojoules per mole. I don't know why I wrote down both, but I used 8.8 8 in my final calculation. So there I have my delta G and my delta S. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for delta G and delta S. I'm sorry, solve for delta G being 0. My delta H I just figured out was negative 174.6 minus, I'm solving for T, and this is negative 0.288 or 85, don't know which because my notes are sloppy. And when I solve for T, I got a value of 612 Kelvin. So basically what that's saying, and let's take a look at the equation, we know here that this would be positive and positive. So to keep that negative, which is what we want, they want to know what temperature at which this becomes thermodynamically favored, it would be all temperatures under 612K would lead that to be negative. All right, I think that's pretty cool. So let's take a look at number 27. Number 27 says, how does delta G change with increasing temperature for the following reactions? So I'm glad I have this written here. We're just going to keep referring up to this. Now we're going to talk about increasing temperature and what happens. Only You only need to look at delta S for this. Delta H doesn't matter because when you increase the temperature, whether or not you're going to change this delta H value for the positive, for the negative, only depends on the delta H, regardless of the value. So, if I have solid going to, solid and liquid going to all solid, we know that the delta S is negative, right? All right, if delta S is negative, looking back up at your thing, um, as we increase the temperature, the delta G, which translates to being equal to delta G, is going to increase. Delta G increases. So as delta G increases numerically, it gets less spontaneous. Okay, let's look at the next one. We go from one mole of gas to two moles of gas. So the delta S is positive. Well, if my delta S is positive, this term then stays negative. So all I'm doing is subtracting more and more and more from my delta H. So my delta G decreases, becoming more and more spontaneous. Remember, because negative is spontaneous in the delta G world. And if you're struggling with any of this, come in and see me. I can explain it probably better live when I can manipulate the formula for you. And this last one, again, it's going to be one of the two above. Um, we have gas liquid going just to gas and gas, so that's an increase in delta S, so the answer is the same as B. Remember, if, if our delta S is positive, it means we're then subtracting more and more and more and more from the H, making it more negative, making delta G more negative, making it smaller numerically on the number line, but more spontaneous. Okay, last couple problems here of our day. Today we've been covering a lot of entropy and enthalpy and the question is find the temperature from part B above in which the um, find the temperature that this reaction becomes spontaneous. Part B the reaction was N2O4 in equilibrium with 2NO. So if we want to find out the temperature again we're going to have to use ghetto homies and from there, we know we need to find H and S because we're looking for the temperature. We can't assume 25 or anything remotely like that. So I'm going to use um, delta H, solve for that, products minus reactants using the data table. 2 times 33.2. Again, you can always slow down what I'm doing. Minus 1 times 9.16 gives me... Five hundred. I'm oh, sorry, fifty-seven point two four kilojoules per mole, and then my delta S 
is equal to 2 times 240 minus 1 times 304. Products minus reactants. Are you sick of that yet? 176 joules per mole, but I'm going to make that 0.176 kilojoules. So now I'm going to plug all that in. I'm going to, again, because I'm looking for the point of spontaneity, I'm going to plug zero in for delta G is equal to delta H, which was 57.24 minus T times 0.176. In this case, our temperature is equal to 325.2 K. And in this case, any temperature, because this term, whole term is negative, any, this temperature and above, any of that will keep that reaction spontaneous or thermodynamically favored. All right, last problem of the day. I'm so happy. Um, this is really cool. This is definitely uh, what, ooh, what's going on? This is definitely what Demo terms a sexy problem. Love it. I'm so happy to have it because we are going to use thermochemistry to derive boiling point. Very exciting. So there's a couple important points that we need to focus on here. It says determine the boiling point of water using thermochemistry values and they give us our H's and S's. Well, what do we do when we boil water? We go H2O, what's the equation? Liquid, right? In equilibrium with H2O gas. So what we're looking at ultimately is the, the temperature at which this phase change happens. When does water boil at what temperature? Um, I think you might know the answer to that already, but we're going to pretend we don't. Now, another important point is at a phase change, which is the point of equilibrium, like right at the point water starts to boil, we're at an equilibrium where we have the reaction going both directions. Well, if I've got delta G positive, negative and positive, back and forth and back and forth, what would the delta G value be? It would be zero. So the lesson here before you even start this problem is knowing that at a phase change, at that point, delta G is zero because we have both reactions, forward and reverse, happening with equal drive. So I need to figure out with ghetto homies, again, at a delta G of zero, what my temperature is. So let's solve for my delta H first. Delta H is equal to, I'm doing water products minus reactants. So that's based on this, gas minus liquid. So negative 241.818 minus negative 285.83. And when I calculate that, I get 44.01 kilojoules. I'm going to shake things up a little bit. I'm going to make those the joules this time. 44,010 joules per mole. I know i got to change one of them, so I might as well change delta H this time. So delta S then, let's find that using Big Mama, is 188.825 minus 69.91, and that's equal to 118.9 joules per mole Kelvin. So now I've got joules and joules. So I can plug them into ghetto homies, letting delta G be zero is equal to delta H, 44.010 minus T times 118.9. All right, when I solve for T, I'm getting 370 Kelvin. Huh, that doesn't mean much to me, so I'm going to convert that to degrees Celsius, and that gives me 97 degrees Celsius. I, I just feel like rounding to one sig fig. Hmm, what happens? Whoa, one sig fig, look at that. So yeah, it's a little smidge off, and, and I need you to realize that all these numbers are rounded, Anything in the table is rounded. So yeah, our answer will be a little bit off, but how cool is it that we utilized two big mamas and a ghetto homie to find the boiling point of water? I think that's super sexy. 
And I, I have to end on this note because there's no way it can get any better than this. So we are done. Y'all have a great day.